Hi and welcome to the Vintage Computer Federation YouTube channel. Your support helps us with creating videos just like this one and restoring vintage computers for all the world to enjoy. So please like, share and subscribe. Thank you. Hello, uh, welcome to our broadcasting event here. Um, we are at live, well not live, we are at the Vintage Computer Federation's Museum uh, and we're doing a talk on the Wang 4000. We have with us an honored guest um, who was an original programmer on the Wang, Ramsey uh, Mahadid. And we also have a, a couple of panelists with us here. We have Jeff and we have Bill, a um, couple of our engineers and uh, technicians here, historians uh, to join us. Um, so we, uh, we acquired, when did we acquire this wine, gentlemen? Um, About how long ago? I would say 2017, somewhere in there. That sounds about right. Sounds about right. Okay. Seventeen. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't involved with the um, with the acquisition of it. Um, who, anybody here did bring it back? Tony or? Bogan was involved in that, and okay. we have to probably get with him on a little bit of the hierarchy. That was that was That's during okay. uh, I was Evan Copeland's time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had it since then. Uh, we brought it right into the museum, um, and uh, you know it got taken good care of here. But we, we haven't, since then, for manpower, haven't really done too much with it. So we are getting down to, well, we have, actually, these gentlemen did do a, a fair amount of good work with it, um, as far as like, but we haven't gotten it going. Documentation, mostly. Yep. So we've studied. Um, there are mysteries to it. Um, and, but before we get into the machine itself, uh, we thought we would like to capture some um, of your history. How did you get into computers and technology? Well, I'll start out. I was, uh, I, I basically met the person who owned Atlas Industrial um, when I was 11 years old through scouting. Oh. He was a, he was a scout, he was an assistant scout master in our local troop. He lived in town. I was 11 years old and one of his sons, a couple of his sons were in scouting as well. And so I knew him through the years as I was going through high school. Um, when I finished high school, he knew I, he knew I was planning to go into engineering. And he, so he, he said, after your first semester, he said, why don't you come back? He said, my company's growing. At the time, you know, the, their main focus was shell and tube heat exchangers, mainly for the chemical processing industry, but the nuclear industry was growing and they were starting to get very involved in building heat exchangers for the nuclear industry. And of course, being a technology that requires a lot of documentation and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, technical work that had to be very accurate, you know, he yeah. wanted to get into, he wanted to get into computers. So I graduated high school in 67 and started working for him uh, summer of 68. And by then he had bought the Wang computer. He had already had a Wang calculator. Um, so he knew the technology and he, so he bought, he bought it in 68 and we started, uh, he knew a little bit about it. Some of the handwritten programs you see that he had, he had done when he had visited Wang laboratories, um, and they were going through the process. I think he had, he may have had some of these instructions before the instruction manual was actually published mm. because uh, most of the handwritten things he has are identical to what's in the manual. Okay. So I started there, like I said, in, in 68 and uh, programming on the Wang computer. And, and he had various programs that he wanted us to, uh, that he needed once I left for school, because I was, uh, I went to school uh, out of state. Okay. So I wasn't here in the, in the, during the, the winter months. So every year when I came back from college, mm -hmm. we would do more programming and he would run the, he would say, I, I'm going to need these programs. And we would program them uh, through the summer months and he would use them 
while we were away. And I'd, I'd come back for Thanksgiving and Christmas breaks and, and, and do, a, do a little bit more work on that. By the time... So I, what, what year did they acquire? I believe, it, I believe it was between 67 and 68. Okay. Because it um, was there when I started in 68. There already, okay. Right, right. so he, he may have acquired it late 67, uh, but that's about the, the time frame. And that's right when you started school and you're back and forth. Right, yeah. I, started, I started school in 67. Okay. I graduated mm -hmm. 71 and then went to work for him full time. And you were studying a, what? Uh, Did well, I miss that? Well, this, this sort of influenced me. I, I was in engineering, but I went into uh, electrical engineering and computer science. Okay. So most of what I was doing in college was programming, primarily Fortran programming. That's what I was learning mm. when I was in college. Like a good engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so when I came out of college, um, or even while I was still in college, we were transitioning. The white computer was a great tool, but it had its limitations in terms of size. So, that, so certain programs, uh, you, you really, depending upon the length of the program, were really not adaptable to, to the WAN computer. So mm -hmm. um, we took our, our Fortran knowledge and then we actually used a teletype on the, the Fortran, on the uh, WAN computer to write up our Fortran programs, uh, cut the tapes, and then enter them into, into a GE timeshare system. Uh, okay. So. I know one of your questions was, did the Wang talk to any other mainframes? It really didn't. It was pretty much a standalone machine. Okay. Uh, but we did use the teletype unit to interface with. Uh, so, okay. One use of that was just to compose material for the mainframe, for the timeshare. Well, huh? no, we, we actually ran a lot of programs well we'll there. get to that but you all but it also served as a well the, the teletype actually served the yeah, teletype to, itself not right. the computer okay so yes, we sir. would um, mm -hmm. so we had some kind of a telephone connection on that where we would dial up it's probably uh, would have been I, I don't remember all the connection maybe an RS-232 type connection well, I probably would have gone to the acoustic modem because, right. uh, yeah, it were, and there is instructions on poster board of actually talking up to that mainframe. Okay. So yeah, so we have to dig that out and actually, right. you know, so that's that is documented. And so from there, you know, we eventually in the mid seventies, around seventy six, between seventy six and seventy eight, we purchased a, a Hewlett Packard uh, mainframe computer, Unix based operating system. Hmm which actually we still use today. It's not the same mainframe. We've transitioned to other HP computers, but we're, but we're still using mm -hmm. a Unix operating system with our Fortran. Okay. All right, so that, that brings us up to the current Pretty state much, of the art yes. there. Um, all right, let's see. I think we'd wanna circle back then to, um, that's like that's like an overall of uh, history of computing there for Atlas. Um, let's talk about what what the programs the Wang did run. Okay, so it ran oh. some of our, it, it ran some of our basic um, engineering type programs like calculating cylinders. Um, and you basically using a, a, a an equation that comes out of a code book, okay, mm -hmm. for, for calculating a cylinder, right. or for calculating a head, or for okay. a flange. And those are relatively small, the heads and cylinders and nozzles are relatively small calculations. When you get into flange calculations, they get quite a bit more complicated mm -hmm. and require, they're more of an iterative process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the computer will, it will, uh, the program will get to the point where it, you've got to make a decision, you know, like mm -hmm. maybe the stress value, maybe the, the stress of the flange is higher than the allowable stress and I have to circle back and make changes to that component so mm -hmm. that it's within the allowable stress values that you're looking for. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, tests and do loops 
okay. within the within these programs. The yep. limitation of the Wang was that you could only put a limit not limited number of instruction steps in it. So you you had to use multiple tapes. So as you know, you, you? as you know, there's a oh there's a tape punch on here. You had to um, swap. You had to swap per <laughs> right. So there was there was a certain number of storage registers and yes. a certain number of actually there's a certain number of registers and you could use some of them for storage and some of them for programming steps. Yes. But the storage steps started backwards at the end of the memory and yeah. the programming mm -hmm. steps at the beginning of the memory. We so would think from at, top down maybe. At some point, bottom you, zero you know, you used up all your memory. So when you were programming, you had to make sure that you used the memory such that when you loaded your second tape, it preserved that memory mm -hmm. and used that memory for doing the next set of calculations. Yes. Was there a name for this process? Was it like it basically called it linking or chaining? Well, yeah. it would be. That's it right. Would, That's what it's like. It yeah. would be similar if you had separate subroutines and you link them together. Well, this not. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't confuse it with a link editor. The point is that you'd do an, a, what was later called an overlay. Overlay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you overlay. would. You basically you were overlaying your your second set of program steps on top of the first one, mm -hmm. but, but preserving your memory. Yeah. And was there any tool to any software to help you this, or was it all by hand? You just have to note how much memory you used. No, you yet? could you could tell on the on the memory unit with the buffers where you were and how much memory you were using. So you knew uh, if you got to a certain point where you were um, running out of programming memory. And running into your storage memory. Uh, you know what? I'll for the watching audience. So I'm going to elaborate on um, what you're talking about a little bit to make it clear. So um, the Wang's memory is. Um, I'm not sh certain. One of the things I wanted to check is how much this actually has. You think it might be four k bytes? I know it seems to be one k bytes per board but yeah. if there's multiple boards then there's I think more. it might have started as a 1k and increased to 4k but I I know there was talk at one time of going to 16k and I don't know if this machine had the capability of doing it or if we ever the manual uh, says it does yeah 16k I don't know if that means you had a whole nother drawer or something yeah, have to, to, you would have to admit but, so I think there's enough room you would have to actually add another see. board to it in an interface yeah. if I can gesture to the camera to try to help our when people look look at this, so if memory starts at zero, and it goes up to four thousand bytes, um, these um, when you say the data, you're talking about your eight byte registers, right? Your no, numbers. I'm talking about your storage, like, like if you want to store if you want to store results or variables. But aren't they eight bytes? They were eight bytes in length. So I read in the manual, like the right. calculator. Okay, so the calculator portion of this, it works in eight byte units and so they call that a register right. and you're and they number the registers from they use the letter s but so s0 is the first register it's way up at the top of memory right. and s1 is the next one down s2 is the next one down so those named registers grow from the top to bottom and your program i suppose you typically load it at zero every time and it occupied so much memory. That's correct. It ran and it updated these guys up here. And then you'd bring in another program which would overlay from zero on up. And it would expect to have those values sitting there and it would add to them or modify them until you loaded all your programs in a sequence until you had your final result. Right. Is that about right? Okay. Yeah. And we all call right. them segments, basically. Segments. Yeah, there you go. So did uh, the PC industry. Okay. All right. And for some reason, I keep the all the cameras are obeying the, the remote, so it's messing them up. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about this one. Okay. I'll probably mess that one up again, too. All right. Um, okay. So um, please continue on uh, talking about code programs you wrote. Okay. Interestingly, though, um, you know, the, the, the calculator technology was relatively new then, and the Wang had, uh, you know, the, the Wang calculators are very popular. Um, when I went back to school in 68, our, our lab, this is at the University of Michigan, our lab, they had a, a math lab and they bought all these Wang 
300 or 320 mm -hmm. calculators. They had, they might have had 20 or 30 in the slab, so that students, you know, because we were still using slide rules then, and that was a, mm -hmm. you know, I, we used the slide rules right, th over there. right yeah. through the, yeah, right through the uh, end of my time at school. They wouldn't allow us to use calculators. Mm -hmm. But I actually, my first job at, at Michigan was teaching how to use white calculators. And it's because of my, because of the, uh, knowledge that I had gained at Atlas during those summers. So, mm -hmm. uh, calculator industry was relatively new and it mm -hmm. was uh, just taking off then. But now in terms of the, you, you want to know more about the programs or the programming? Um, well, if you had a train of thought with getting from calculators, uh, in your perspective, uh, up to the Wang, if that's that's well, I mean, that's, that made it very easy to program the Wang because the arithmetic ah, unit on the Wang was pretty the much yeah. identical to the, the calculator. And you use mm -hmm. yes. that arithmetic unit a lot in the programming. Okay. So a lot of these, a lot yes. of these uh, keys on the keyboard uh, are basically telling the computer what to do. Like, uh, okay, we're going to transfer control to the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to tell the computer to stop. Now you're going to allow the, allow the user to enter data. Yeah. Okay, and now you have to tell the computer to continue. But each time you have to give it instructions as to which unit it's going to go to. Is it going to the memory yes. unit? Is it going to the, te the, the tape unit? Which is part of the, the punch. The punch and the uh, teletype are part of the same unit. Mm -hmm. It just had to do with whether the tape mm -hmm. was on or off as to whether it punched tapes. Mm -hmm. and, okay. then you, you know, and then you had your keyboard, obviously. Yeah. Um, Would it be useful now to show the keyboard? Would you like to talk sure. in terms of it? Okay, stay, stay right there. I'm going to bring it down and put a camera on it. Give me the uh, display. You just hold on to the display here because we might want to look okay. at that. Yeah, we might want to look at that. Also. A duplicate. We didn't take that out of the unit. Uh, so. Hang down then. So I think if almost ready. Yeah. Do you happen to have a wine calculator here? I no. do not. No. no. I, I Sadly, uh, I've never touched useful. one. Yeah. I've really? only found surplus parts, but I never touched one. So the the wine calculator um, consists of this. Calculator, you have a something online yeah. for old the old website, yeah. and one of them shows there the, is. The, the Wang. I have trouble bringing it up. So. Shows the Wang calculator, and I believe it's just this portion, and okay. the rest of these were programming. The rest of these steps are programming. Steps. Okay. And I know it faded out over the years. These these red ones, you know, if you hit the because there's the shift key. And then there's some some red commands on top of the uh, other mm. commands. So if you look at some of these commands, uh, basically, when you start programming, and a lot of this is in the manual, you do your first step would be like a temporary transfer of control. So you hit the TTC for temporary transfer of control, and then you you say you want. Um, control channel select. So now you're telling the computer where you want it to go. So if you say seven, I believe it's memory. If you say mm -hmm. six, it's the um, keyboard. Yep. And if you say zero, it's uh, not the keyboard, I'm sorry, the teletype. And if you say zero, it's the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So the keyboard obviously has no, has no storage <laughs> registers. So mm -hmm. then you, you, you want to tell it which, which channel you want to have input on and which channel you want to have output on. So let's say I'm programming and I say input channel select seven, which is my memory. <clears throat> I'm sorry, input channel select zero, which is my keyboard. And output channel select seven, which is my memory. Then you have the 
input subchannel select, which and I, I think it's this red ISS key above the ICS, which tells you at what point in memory you want to start your program. So you could have a program starting at zero in memory, or you could have one starting at some other register in memory. And then you, then you start programming from the keyboard. And the, for any of your arithmetic <coughs> operations, you would use the keyboard just the same as you would use a one calculator. Okay. Okay. And every time you want to enter a new variable, then you would have to tell it you want to transfer control back to the keyboard, and then you enter what it, whatever uh, value you have, and then you, you hit the continue sign, and it continues. And that's basically how that's basically how you input. Um, as I understand it, there's four registers on here. There's two adders. There's the the uh, register, which is your which is your display, and then you have the uh, w, you have the L register, which accumulates all of your uh, multiplication and division functions. Okay. So. You know, without getting into, without turning it on and getting into some of the, uh, how these functions work, most of yeah. it is pretty much addressed in a manual depending upon what you want to do. Right. right. So then, then you would, trans then you, once your program was in and you debugged it, and you can, these, these buttons help you with the debugging. <clears throat> you can go to certain addresses and you can see on, on, the, on your lights, the lights on here as well your, as lights on the panel, mm -hmm. yep. tell you what instruction you're at and what, uh, what code. Every, every uh, instruction has a binary code mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. listed in the instruction manual. Gotcha. Um, so for the viewing audience who may not go and look at the book, um, the architecture of the hardware is um, boxes that have a common bus and the keyboard and the programs can like hit which box is active tell it to do something right and and by this method the boxes can transfer data from one place to another you can get stuff the memory can transfer stuff to the terminal and and so the it's interesting i read that the the instruction sets divided into three three parts one is teletype commands right. and they're kind of similar to what you would talk to the teletype with uh, the same byte codes and then there's a set of uh and these are all 8 bit byte operands or uh instruction codes that's the size of them right and the middle one, uh, middle set, are the calculator opcodes, and they are exactly what the calculator would generate. Right. And that gets stored in the programs. And when those those calculator commands get transferred to the calculating unit, that's why it does its thing. Um, and then the the last one is like the program control commands that. I think are represented by these guys. So, so when you press these, these go into memory, and they're effectively your your looping constructs, right? Or your subroutine. Uh, everything that you need to express in terms of the, the instructions that the computer can do hmm. are just generated with single keystrokes on here. Right. So here's a, you know, like if you're going to a um, subroutine, you would have this jump. And this jump would tell you to, to go to a certain register in the computer, and then mm -hmm. at that at that register you would have a routine, yep. and then it would return again. It's hard so, to see some of these, but I think the return is the shift red so, above the jump. So that is so foreign for like all of us that came after this era, where we'd have to type the words of those things into some kind of a language right. that would translate them to the byte codes. Um, What's this remind you of, guys? Any one of our more 70s, 80s, well, 80s computers that well, does one? I would say that um, to correlate things, 
uh, just a few years before this, 1964, is when the Olivetti Programmer 101 came into uh, being, which was a programmable calculator. And similar to this, uh, that everything was a keystroke. And uh, what's odd is that the Olivetti had a magnetic card reader and, um, and recorder. So you could okay. write your program, record it on the card, and bring it back days later and just load from there. Right. So I'm surprised this had no mag this had no magnetic cards. No, it just used a punch tape. Okay, so that's uh, so the punch tape was basically the same as the magnetic card. So, but the point is that, as you said, you'd have to unless there was a dump instruction, you'd have to say set input from memory, output to tape, this length, zip, and there's your your core dump. Right, and and it would punch on the tape. If your tape's turned on, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the way you'd save your work. Right. And so you saved it on a tape. But <laughs> also then when you read it back, it sounds like you'd have to say from tape to memory starting here and somehow it would know the length or you would just have to give the length? Of the, of the uh, no, it, whatever the length of the tape was, it would load into memory. Uh-huh. So, because mm -hmm. as you mentioned- Until it got EOT. End it was of the end of transfer. End oh. of transfer at the end of the tape. Right. Oh, okay. So oh, yeah, yeah, there's no, you didn't have to know the length. It was, but I guess you could easily overwrite something in that you were trying to keep. Well, I mean, top, right? you, what you were doing <laughs> is, um, I mean, when you programmed it from here, you knew how much storage you were using. Yeah. So when you generated the tape, it only generated it for that amount of storage. Mm -hmm. If you were running a program, you. Most of the time, you only ran one program at a time. Yeah. You'd, you'd load a tape, you'd run your program, right. and then when you're ready to, to do some other program, you would load that tape. So there wasn't a problem with mm -hmm. having to know the length of the tape because mm -hmm. it, it was already programmed on in, into this particular machine. Um, you could generate you could generate the um, tape. Yeah, you, you could program from the teletype as well. You could. Yes. Yeah. How would you do it? You well, you would say you would tell you, you would say well, you want your input channel to be the, the teletype, mm -hmm. and your output channel to be the memory, mm -hmm. and you could type these commands depending textually. It, yes. Type the text. Well, I, I don't know if it was textually or you had to put the, the binary code. But I'm in. thinking it had to yeah, be the binary the, code. Uh, yeah, uh, see in the manual, it's binary code right. for all these functions. Well, right. uh, so, octal specifically, octal, octal binary. Yeah. 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 So, you know, oh, that, obviously that, you want to You didn't do that very much, I, no. I'm going to gather. <laughs> <laughs> but if you needed to, if, less, if this was down, but you, you could get you, it done. You could right? do that, and, you, and I believe that there were some, sometimes we wonder if we were correcting, you could make a correction to a tape, maybe a little easier that way. But okay. generally, we did it all from here. So all your commands yeah. really are on here. Um, so have you guys seen any other system where you had a programming in interface that was a one button per thing. Hewlett Packard what? in their instrumentation had similar type of functions to do that. Is that right? They, yes, they, they designed up something. In fact, the case is design it? is similar to a lot of, of uh -oh. instrumentation. Uh, programming ROMs, that sort of thing in the early days, Hewlett okay. Packard would set that up, even with Nixie 2 readouts. So yeah, very, very classic type design. Yep. Well, programmable, programmable calculators from the 70s to their mm -hmm. end of oh, life, right, right, which was right. recent, they were all uh, keystrokes. Right. So well, I didn't know to bring my yes. HP. Yes. I brought one of my HPs, people would be happy. Yeah. They love their HPs, but it's all the same concept as you. Right. Yeah. You could do it. The one thing, though, is with a calculator, you can do immediate mode or program. Does this right. have an immediate mode so you could use it as a calculator? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can. Yep. Yes, yeah, so as soon as you turn it on, you can use it as a calculator. Yep. Okay. Until, until you transfer control to memory, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Interesting, to, huh? to use the memory, you can use it as a calculator. So, yeah, so anyone with an HP calculator has this modal idea of immediate right. versus programmed. And so I tr let me try it out. Okay, now I'll program it, and it's all, and it's, it'll cycle for me. Let me see uh, what I have here. I might have this HP programmable here. Oh, okay. really? <laughs> Comes prepared. Well, uh, bonus points if it's red LED. <laughs> <laughs> and NICAD right. batteries that are not leaking. Yeah. Yes. Right. 
Oh, it's a new one. It's a new one, yeah. No, it's not my old programmable. But still, but the you, idea. Could, you could still program it. Yes, of yeah. course. So, That's the whole well, idea. And yeah, right. And you'd ha and and, and you wouldn't resort to typing the text of things. The buttons were right. Right. the programming yeah. uh, uh, statements. So what's, what's interesting about this keyboards I mean, with this computer, though, is that now if you want to have output to the teletype, you know, you've got to have all the you got to type all those words or all those letters into each register in really? order to, and then it's and, and read it and write it. Like Ooh. in octo, like because there's no ASCII in in this or I don't know. Yeah, so you have to. Um, I, I've got to take a look at that and see or how. Maybe we did there it. were subroutines that helped you with. Yeah, there's a text the, or the instruction book shows you how to do it. You know, um, our original. We don't have a reprint yet. I have. I think this yeah. is the easiest way for you to look. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you, uh, Atlas then, 1967, they get this. They got it because, uh, they, well, they prior to getting this, they had Wang calculators. You had Wang calculators in right. school. Um, I'll take a look. What, was the, how many years was this computer their only computer at Atlas? I would, before I would time say time sharing, you know, and before other, we were time sharing, kind of, I would say from about 67 or 68 until about 1970. Okay. I think so, about 1970, 71 is when we started getting into the, the, the time sharing. Three ish years, plus or minus, that was the main thing for doing your automated calculations for manufacturing. Right. Interesting. Um, now, prior to that, we used to do, we used to have, uh, Printed forms with the equations on them, mm -hmm. and then oh, aren't they the ones we have? Those big uh, sheets. We'll I'll have to take a look, but I'm talking about uh, you, you know that it was just really a like an input sheet where the designer would fill in the diameter right. and pressure. So and it's like a you know, piece of paper on. that had you had a pre-printed form right. and actually calculate based upon whatever design you were And, and they would use a slide rule to calculate that. Uh, yeah, right, sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have to calculate until we got the Wang calculators. At, uh, John DiLorenzo, who started Atlas, um, he's, he bought a welding shop in 1959. And then, uh, his, and his dream was always to build heat exchangers. So. By the by, the early to mid '60s, he was building primarily heat exchangers. So a lot, of, so a lot of these forms were were um, set up for that type of work. Any association with Foster Wheeler, or was oh, that yeah. one of your, no, your said, direct one competitors? One of our, no, they'd be a customer. They'd be a customer, right? Yeah, because they were into that sort of stuff too. So, yeah, I mean, we were getting okay. into. Yeah, I mean, a lot of yeah. our customers were made Westinghouse, General Electric, right? Uh, on yeah. the, on the power side of things, uh, we did see that combustion engineering, yeah. yeah, and then you know, and then and then the chemical companies, Kodak. Mm -hmm. Kodak was big back then. Now it's Eastman, Eastman Chemicals, Kodak, uh, and the food companies, Procter and Gamble, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, pharmaceuticals, Merck. I mean, in New Jersey, the pharmaceutical companies were huge. Right. Yes. So we did a lot with the pharmaceuticals. Right. Yeah. So take a look at. These, so those, um, yeah, those. Some of those are programs, and some of those were sheets that they filled out. Yeah, m yeah. Most of those are programs. You want to scroll yourself, and yeah, you, can, have, you can have you can position. I'm having trouble anything. seeing. Oh, it, I'm sorry. You know, let me well, get, I mean, it's, let me get a little closer to you. It's got it. I think this will come right up. Since you're not on screen, it doesn't matter. Come on. Better? Okay, so this is this is actually a program that's in the instruction manual. Oh, it is, huh? Yes. It's a, a sample. Lot of these are. So this one uh, is actually right here. It's page. Read it off. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this particular program. But you picked an odd one. Oh, but well, we can no, go from okay. top to bottom. I, no, they're okay. not stored like, in any particular so this order. This one 
tells you how to write a number to the teletype in a particular format. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the register that you see on the mm -hmm. screen has the numbers in a certain location. Mm -hmm. But if you want to print out in a certain format, you've got to get those numbers into a certain position in this register mm -hmm. and then transfer it to memory. So it's in, it, it's in a certain location so that when you print it out on the teletype, it, it prints out those particular digits with, gotcha. with the decimal point and with spaces. So what this does is it takes whatever numbers on the keyboard and multiplies, uses mm -hmm. the enter button, whatever numbers in here, it enters it into the, it'll go into the W register, to the L register. Okay. And then it gets multiplied by 0. 0.0001 <laughs> because you want to round it off after a certain number of digits. So now mm. you've moved, now you've moved that number over into this register. Gotcha. Then you say you want your output channel select to be seven, which is your memory. And, okay. and OSS to Line be 100. So 13. at 100, you're going you're gonna to write mm -hmm. the contents of this into memory. Now, it's a, now this has a decimal point and a, a sign. So when it goes into memory, it's going to it, it, it's go in with a, with a prefix on it that tells it whether it's positive or negative and the location of the decimal point. Okay? And then... Um, you Call write out the there. line numbers while you're talking there, okay, so and now, we don't have your finger on this one. Okay, and now you say output channel select 114. So now you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're line going, 21, mm -hmm. right? It, yeah. yeah. So if we scroll up, yeah, yeah, okay. there we go. Okay. So at that point, that goes back and says, okay, make your input channel seven. At 25. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, and then your input sub channel at 057. Now at 057, there's a character. Um, so if, mm -hmm. you, if we go down to. Good. You can scroll there with the mouse. Mm -hmm. Just, just spin the wheel. Okay. Yeah. So at 057 is a space. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now it's going oh, to. Oh, yeah. There, yep. So that's. So it's using it here, 057. Right. Um, and it transfers that space to the output channel select six. Okay. And I don't know why there's no input sub channel select here, but it's probably. Um, hmm. You, you pick one or something, or I don't know. It, well, there's oh. a. Oh, it says uh, type using SD. Um, yeah. So then I don't know. what it does, it's going to go to input sub channel. And I believe it's um, 50. This is input sub channel select 56. Mm-hmm. Let me look in here. It's in okay. The, because in here, if you look, if you look in the book, which is a little bit, page forty-six. Right. It's, it's page forty-four, example five eight one. Right. And it tells this is going to uh, print the print the first two digits. Okay. So it's going to. Um, Input channel select 107 at that point. And I don't know why it doesn't say 107 there, but it goes to 107 and prints the first two digits of that memory. Then it comes back and it does see it's a single digit transfer. So it goes to mm -hmm. it does. 107 and it, it prints a single digit and then it prints a, another single digit. So, so those are the first two digits of the number you want to print. So there, there's like an auto increment implied right. in there, right? And then it goes okay. to 56 and does a single digit transfer. 56 is a decimal point. Ah, okay. Okay. And that does the a single digit transfer. Point. And then it goes to 111 and it just transfers the rest of it. 
Okay. To the output channel, which Neat. is six. Uh -huh. So it's printing a number in a format of of uh, well, readable, text readable, uh, and well, it's it's uh, the format is going to be xxx point xxx. There that's what it's mm. trying to do. It's yeah. trying to do it. Uh, yeah. You know. Oh, that's fascinating. So, in order to print that, this is these are the steps you'd have to go yeah. through. Now you can appreciate Fortran format statements. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> because now you could do an F, uh, what was it, 6.2 or right. whatever it was for a uh, floating point, two Three. digits, point, and then the rest. Right. Or however. The interesting here thing, thing here, though, is that you'd have to know what the size of that number is mm -hmm. before you can even do that kind of routine. Because if, if you had a number that was over 100, it'd have to be a different format. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the same thing, you know. If you have a, if you're doing a do loop on this, mm -hmm. you have to have a counter. You got to use one of your registers. You say, okay, let's say you want to do in Fortran, do mm -hmm. ten one e i equals one comma ten. Well, now you have to have a register and put ten in it and keep subtracting one from that register. Mm -hmm. And each time, this is with this TSW key. It tests the sign of W. Mm -hmm. If if it's oh. negative. I see. It, you know, Light bulb. It, it, it jumps out, and if it's positive, it continues. So you got to have a. You keep going to that do loop to see. Okay, did I do that subroutine to see if you got to the to the your tenth time you checked, see, and was, then you jump out of the routine. Was that pretty much the only logical test you could do? Was testing for negative and branch? Yes. Ooh, that's that's like PDP, right? Gosh, that makes you appreciate Fortran Zero. <laughs> With the, uh, if you, uh, yeah. a historical note was the first uh, Fortran, there was the arithmetic if. You'd say if number, and right. you had for uh, three numbers for jump here if negative, jump yeah. here if zero, jump here if positive. You don't even have that luxury. Right. You can only go negative. It's, it's almost like when you're, do, when you're doing it in Excel, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, yeah, I mean, you had to, every one of, the, and every one of them took a fair number of steps in memory, too, because, you, you know, you've got all these steps that you're using up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. Yeah, it ends up taking a lot. So this manual is pretty, actually, these cards, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as I went through them, yeah. were pretty much identical so to was, the examples in here. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, since there was a, here, 11105, now that other, so what you say, those were already preloaded segments, essentially subroutines. No, no, well, not preloaded, they're in the manual. <clears throat> okay, but you had to load them somehow from a tape. Or, or from here. So, yeah, that was my next question. Uh, was this a composition for writing a program that got punched, or was this for, you know, somebody would key this in every time they wanted to do this? No, you, you, know, you would punch a tape for this. Okay. Okay. So this was a, this was a this was a programming sheet for making a tape. Somebody said this a, was their yeah, program it, it, it's design. It's a programming sheet for entering into the computer. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when you wanted to punch the tape, all you yeah, did was, was it's, it's on a solid card, you know, it's not like just a notebook page. It's like it was as if this was going to be referenced over and over again because it's a physical cardboard card. That's Yeah. What, but I but again, John DiLorenzo had visited the factory and I don't think they had come out with the manual the, oh. yet. And he, so uh. he wrote all this because these, when I look at them, are pretty much identical to the manual. Now he may have, yeah, he may I have also you. written right. these because if from, um, he may have duplicated it from here mm -hmm. just just but for clarity. I, I can't or? imagine why because it's not a, that's not a program he would use all the time. Mm -mm. To, to me, maybe it, it was a learning tool. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exercise. Okay. Then some of the cards are like pure formulas, right? So, so these are these are equations that that we would have used when we were programming this the computer. Mm -hmm. He would have given to us and say, okay, because I knew nothing in, in college about heat mm -hmm. transfer. Yeah, but he did. So he would he would write all this stuff out so that we had it, had it to use for programming here. And most of, most of the time, we looked at the equation and just started programming. Uh, wow. we, we didn't fill out the, 
these forms that they show yeah. you in here for the, to the for the various registers. Yeah, right. Because we, we could just input it and then we could test it. If we knew it worked, then we would cut the tape. And then when we wanted to use that program again, we would just input the tape. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's impressive that you guys could go from from your schooling to go from the equation to linear code or looping code. Um, correcting mistakes must have been kind of tricky though. There's no way to move stuff that, you know, make space for code that you forgot to put in and stuff like that. You'd have to overwrite and just keep going or something. Yeah, or you would just, um, and that, that's a good question. I have to look to see if there was a way of, of pushing it down. I have a feeling there probably was, um, but we, but you could, um, or did go, you, you, you could go in and tell the memory to, um, to go to a different input channel and then and, and, and transfer a, uh, a number of steps. Oh, right. Transfer. Oh, could it transfer memory to memory? Could you have I the input memory and output memory? That would give you an ability to move something or to at least duplicate. I'd have to look at that. I don't remember doing that. All right. My guess, my guess is more that we would um, load the tape at a different. We had a tape oh, and we just loaded it. Start loading it. Yes. A okay. Point. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, dump it to tape and then bring it back, starting at a different place. Yeah, and give by yourself. That's a good question. I'll have to look, I'll have to <laughs> look into that a little further. I think the manual talks about, or I, I may be confusing with another manual, um, creating a a patch by jumping to another location where you fill out some stuff and then you return back again to where you were. So it's a little ugly, ugly, it doesn't make it concise, but you can get the job done. Yeah. So uh, one level of um, return, there's no stack, right? Uh, you only get you only get to jump to one subroutine and return. You can't have subroutine, jump to subroutine, something jump to subroutine. Uh. Because I think it stores the return address in a specific register. I, I think you're right. Yeah, I think the. Um, but I have to take a look at that. Uh, okay. Because there's some examples that may that, that may allow you to do that. Okay. Um, if I may. Um, yep. You know, he's on some machines, when you do a jump to subroutine, you're uh, like these early ones it would have a link register. So the return address would go into a register. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted, you could, if you could, if you could access that register, oh. if there was a way to save that register and put it back, mm -hmm. now you can have multiple yes, levels, yeah. but you had to do it explicitly. Yeah, right. You had to have your own so, convention. Whereas, because yeah. there was no stack. That's exactly the point. Yeah, right. And uh, people who used, uh, I think, PIC-16, there, there are some current processors that have this, uh, such limitations. So it's not, <laughs> not a, unusual. Uh, unusual. Or yeah. anyone who does interrupt work, there's an interrupt vector. And if you have an interrupt upon an interrupt, you stomped upon yourself. Yep. You have to make yourself re-entrant. That was one of the uh, uh, things you had to code yourself back then. It was re-entrancy and, re and recursion. Yeah. Well, this, you can, you can access the, uh, it, it's S0 and S1. You can access on here mm -hmm. and bring them up to the register. And, and I think you can change them, but you got to be careful. And it explains that in here, your, your return address and your... Um... Ah, let's, let's look, at, look over this. This is, uh, looks like the entire instruction set, the three, three areas, right? This is like... So... Or am I wrong? Yes, am no, I look, jumping to conclusions this is, this here? Is a, this is a program that... Oh, that it's a program. A okay. squared plus B squared oh. plus C squared. Oh, yeah, okay. And this is the same program if you just did it on the arithmetic unit. Oh, okay. So if you had if you had already stored a variable in register six and another one in register 15. By the way, yeah. he's pointing to line 41 and... 46 yeah. or so. So you yeah. say recall six here, and then you say x squared. So it, it gets into the register. Then you clear your right register. You add that, that value to it. 
then you recall. Oh. Your, um, mm -hmm. The mouse is on our recording, so, so this is sufficient. Then you recall 15, register, which is register 15, because the, 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 this, the arithmetic unit has storage. I don't know if it's using mm -hmm. storage from the memory. It has its own um, core, a little bit of okay. core in it, yeah. And then you say, you know, you, you square that value, you add it to the right register, you take the square root, and then you store the, the contents in 23. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. in here, this program, it says, so you take temp temporary transfer of control, and then you set the control channel select to zero, which is the keyboard. And at this point, it says input A here, but you're really inputting it before you, you say continue. So the, at this point, the, the, the program will stop. You'll input your value from, the, from here. Mm -hmm. And then you can then it continues and then you hit um then the pro the program will do x squared clears the registers and then it comes back again it says temporary transfer controls so back to the keyboard so you input your second value and when you say continue it goes back to memory and it, and it, and it continues on it takes x squared adds it to the register takes mm -hmm. the square root and then jumps back to zero if you want to if you want to go back and do it again. Oh, okay. And then yeah. use your end of transfer. So this is a program that basically does this. Okay. Yeah. No. Interesting. Did this? Did the result go onto the screen automatically, or did you have to? Because uh, I don't see you moving to the screen. So um, the, the display went off. The uh, the results displayed, or was it memory? Um. As it, soon it, as I think the result of the, the square the root was updates the, the, the display. Yeah, it, it's it, because it, it's it in the it's display. in the calculator. So whatever the, yeah. the calculator does, it comes to the is, is on the display. Oh, right. so when you're running a program, the just the the neon the, the is still scrambling and showing you everything real time. I think it would be, yeah, uh, theoretically I, in my mind, but yeah. It's um, it's it's doing everything here because this is where we used to get all the results. Yeah. So the results we would see on the register. One blessing is you, you can get your results without actually having to program displaying the results because this thing is the head of the calculator. Okay. So every calculation is is there. But if we if store I'm, it, if I, I yeah. haven't okay. done it, I'm, but if, <laughs> I hope I'm correct. But, but. but if we took these values like x squared here yeah. and, and stored it in a register, now it would be, be part of the memory. Okay. Now, the reason I ask is that a computer I used had no display, really. And so if you wanted a result, you had to say print. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it was in memory, but you can't get to it until you print it. Mm -hmm. That was why I was curious about why it was an explicit or implicit item. Right. The answer yeah. is here is implicit because it's on the display. It's going through the same ALU right. as the calculator. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. My aha yeah. right. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the calculator is the a ALU. <laughs> yeah. And the calculator has, it's like you have a, LED display attached to the L ALU, you know, in, inside of a, trip, a regular computer, right? It's like just there's a display of what's in the ALU. That's, that's what this is. And then it's of really course, cool. You could write your program to take that whatever output you have and and write write it to the teletype so you can get your mm -hmm. printed output. Yeah, and we just saw how um, how uh, excruciating that was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah. With the, yeah, with each character. Yes, yeah. I know it is. But again, once you have a program written and somebody's using it over and over again, it's yeah, it's a labor saver. That's right. Yeah. And as you explained that that routine would be on a tape and you put it, uh, that segment somewhere in lower memory. So let's, as you saw, we saw like a hundred or something, but you're programming up in zero to ninety-nine. Then you jump down, back up, and it, you, and you just don't, and you just keep it there all day. With the, the uh, like when you were using this, would you just keep? Uh, would you load some memory and say, oh, 
I'll keep it there all day as long as no one turned it off. Right. Oh, yeah. actually, his core memory is still there. Yeah. Yes. So are each of these, like the first thing is um, is how you do it in a program, and the next thing is how you do it on the calculator and ditto here? Well, program. no, not necessarily. No. Okay. Um, this... This looks like um, a subroutine. Yeah, so this is this is a subroutine that um, determines if B is greater than A. So mm, it's comparing. Yeah. yeah. And then if once they're equal. And again, this is this is in the book as is well. It? Oh, okay. All right. Again, these might have been so, um, exercises then, yeah, so not not operational I printed, tools. I printed some of these, and I can leave them with you. Oh, okay. But um, this. Oh, did you annotate them for us? So this here sure. says if you go to <clears throat> example five point three point one, page thirty four okay. of the manual. All right. It's here. This is th page thirty five. Yeah. This is page 37. Oh, examples. yeah. Examples. So Very cool. Every one of these comes out of here. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. And I'll leave the, I can leave these with you. And these are basically explanations of how the commands work, but if you, <clears throat> this is all in, in the manual itself. Right. Okay. Somebody just brought it out as a cheat sheet. Right. In other words, yeah. They did a nice job of it. That's what we were always amazed at the artwork. Yeah, that was done by John DiLorenzo. He okay, was, the owner of the company. Yep. Okay. So, um, all right. Thank you for annotating those. Though that'll help us um, perhaps make use of them or understand and satisfy our curiosity at the very least. Um, so you. This machine was in heavy use then um, with this automation. How did time sharing um, or other computing that came later augment or replace, how did that go with the Well, it's, it, it basically the, the ease of Fortran programming in terms of commands. You did, yeah. um, and then secondly, the capacity of the machine. You know, okay. some of our programs are pretty long pushing the limits of this yeah. thing right oh yeah with the reloading the, and I, I get involved a lot with the asme codes code writing asme so, yeah, American American society of mechanical engineers so, oh, so, okay. so the pressure vessel codes we write yes. a, we write a lot all the uh, pressure vessel codes for the uh, for the industry and they're used worldwide <clears throat> but mm -hmm. over the years because of computers we've been able to take equations that have we made a lot of assumptions many years ago in order to, to, to simplify an right. equation. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. yeah. But the result, although it was, it was an okay result, it was relatively crude. And now we're able to, to have these um, very complicated equations in the code because we, you know people are gonna be use, com use computers uh, in mm -hmm. order to solve the, the, the problem. Yes. Um, so over the years, you know, we've, we, Obviously, this is 4K, and I believe I believe it may have been increase of 16K. Whether we got a, a 16K upgrade or not, I don't quite remember. Okay, but you know, basically, it was just too small a machine to. Uh, and and Wang, I don't think ever kept up with the with the other industries like uh, IBM and mm -hmm. Hewlett Packard. And, well, we know they changed gears. They they. If I, uh, the available information, I suppose is correct, um, that this 4,000 got relegated back to the calculator department and they stopped marketing it as a computer. And then it came out with follow on equipment that was more like a mini computer mm -hmm. proper with logic and, yeah. and no, no dedicated calculator section. Um, so, um, things changed for them, but, but you guys didn't see, did, 
your owner, uh, somebody didn't decide to keep going with Wang, uh, which and kind of side shifted to something else. And yeah. time sharing was the first kind of new thing that added augmented the Wang or yes. replace it pretty quick, or did they go side by side for a uh, while? No, it went side by side for a while because we still had employees that um, that weren't getting on weren't mm. getting on the timeshare ah. and using those programs. It's a privilege. Um, There's a, yeah, but it was right? more or less um, the more complicated programs. Uh, so, you know, it, it, in our business, we have a, we have thermal design basically, which designs the size of the heat exchanger, and then we have mechanical design, which designs the components. Mm -hmm. The thermal design is quite a bit more technical in terms of decision making than yeah. mechanical right. design is. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the programming was quite a bit more complicated. Sure. Yeah. So those programs resided pretty much on the time show. They all did. But uh, our, our employees could still use the Wang computer to do all their other calculations that they needed. So it well, was still very useful, but we just didn't use it for for calculations for big for stuff. very long. Because yeah. you'd be loading segments after segment after okay. segment to yeah. try to... So you didn't bother re-implementing what already worked okay on the Wang. You, you moved to the stuff you couldn't do on the Wang. On primarily, would that be the strategy? You it, know? Initially, and, yeah. and then eventually, you know, when we got our own uh, computer, a bigger computer, for, yeah, the Unix-based yeah. uh, HP computer. Then we moved all of our, we, we made all of our applications, uh, you know, Fortran, Fortran-based. So. Um, there's a practicality there, I think. Um, if you were time sharing, you were probably still, I think you described this earlier, you were punching stuff and, and reading back punch stuff to get it to the timeshare, right? right? So you had, you had your Fortran work on the, on the tape. So when uh, you got a computer in house, you probably were transferring those paper tapes you know, into the disk system or, or tape system on those or tape something, system. right? Yeah. You had to segue, tape. Yeah. segue, and then, then you were free of uh, tapes for your Fortran work at, mm -hmm. at that point. But keep in mind, too, that every all these Fortran compilers are a little bit different. Oh, they yeah. all have their enhancements. Yeah. So even though you took the, the programs from tape, from paper tape to magnetic tape and loaded them in a computer, now you still have to do a fair amount of work on them to get them right, to yeah, run on that, that particular compiler system. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, well, you, while archiving the tapes, I noticed some oddities. Some uh, The Fortran listings had some keywords and some rather odd phrases that were not standard Fortran. So that gave, uh, so I'm not sure what dialect that was. Uh, that was, uh, so that, that's one uh, mystery we have is uh, what, we could ascertain the machine the Fortran ran on by the, its oddities. Yeah, I, I'd have to take a look and see what the... Uh... A, a, a frustration is that all of the paper tapes were only pure listings, but they didn't show anything from the compiler itself. Like on IBM machines, you'd usually get headers saying which compiler it is, which version, and cross-reference, all sorts of other um, a supplemental uh, things to help you debug it, like a symbol table. Well, yeah, but see, I think what, what was happening with that is that these were all loaded into, you know, the GE timeshare, and then we would compile them on their, you know, on their computer. Um, and I don't think we ever got anything back if we, other than our results, and if we had errors, and we had to figure out what the what the issue was. Because so we were working through the teletype, so it was, mm -hmm. you know, it would have been difficult to, uh, you had to get the, the, the program right pretty much uh, yeah. at the outset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, just curious, was there, were you aware of the bill for the timeshare? Were you billed by the minute, or did you do things to minimize your connect time? Well, we used the, we used the paper tapes a lot to, to minimize the connect time. I mean, that's the other thing I wanted to, to say is that it, all your input, all your input, you could put on a paper tape. So you could, you know, you could, mm -hmm. uh, and then mm -hmm. you use that paper tape. And, and it was good because you could use the same, you know, input 
later on down the line. Like let's let's say you're designing a heat exchange, you have a, you have a certain amount of input. Well, you can put that on the tape and save it, and then later, if you have to come back to that application, when you ran when you ran it on here, it would run from the tape. Uh, Mm -hmm. Instead of inputting it from the keyboard, you could input it from the tape into registers. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the reason I was asking mm -hmm. is because one of the interesting uh, reasons for having in-house computers versus timeshare or now cloud computing mm -hmm. is that when it's in-house, you have the electric bill, but there's no use meter. You, right. You're not paying by the minute normally. Whereas if you do a uh, timeshare system, it's like the old days when we were on CompuServe or Genie. Right. There was you were charged by the minute that you were connected, and you were charged uh, for other services. So that's why I was curious if that uh, your boss was there with a, like a taxi meter going <laughs> ding ding ding. You know. <laughs> well, we're a relatively small company, and I and uh, we could control that pretty easily. But um, and I believe that that's. We, de we developed a lot of our input through paper tape so that it would be it would input a lot quicker. So we, we would uh, make up a, our input for a particular program on paper tape and then when we when we logged into our system just ran the tape into the uh, to the program we were using. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. We also noticed that you were doing a lot of um, test results to your customers on this machine, where you actually pre-printed the form out and I guess would actually log the data that was calculated. Because oh, yeah. you would see the header, you know, Atlas, you know, heat exchanger right. and your address and the whole nine yards and then your customer's information on it. Hmm. What this modulus test was, what this pressure was, that sort of thing. So we yes. saw a lot of that on there. The on these? Forms. On, on the tape, yeah, yeah the tapes. tapes, so you spit them out. They have and I, I have them here if uh, you, you want to review any particular line item that you... So yeah. We saw your customer listing. No. Yeah, all your customer listings were don't, on the tapes. So I don't know. remember. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I didn't I, do my homework. <laughs> on these tapes, I think most Shame of these... Shame on you. I think most of these no tapes Apple. No Apple were not me. intended for the, for the, for the Wang 4000. That, that, oh, they I, I don't think most. No. Yeah, I, I can tell you these these particular um, these were part of our accounting. So we wrote all of our accounting systems in Fortran, mm. all of our scheduling systems. Right. And th these uh -huh. programs, I mean, we still have today in our. We use still those still use those names. Those are source programs. That's why the S O R C. Okay. That's okay. A, that's a Fortran source program. Um, here you go. Point yeah. with this and scroll. You can yeah, so customer more. source mm -hmm. is um, probably and they're clickable. Like they'll, they'll open up if you want to look at them. They'll click right in. in the, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, well, it would just be like the the. Uh... Oh, that one didn't. Oh it's, no! Oh, go I'm sorry, back. It's the go wrong to the one. strip. Go back. Yeah, yeah. stripped. Right. That's the uh, next wall column, one. please. Oh, okay. That, yeah. There you go. I didn't really because uh, that's with parity and that's with the, this is. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So you can see that's a Fortran program. Um, yeah. This is. Uh, this is calling our job number. Uh, this is the. Sh this is whether it shipped or not. This was the hours worked. <laughs> so these were, you know, we had a. You build by this then. It was like. Hours yep. worked and all this is well. We would collect like from the like in the shop. They would they would do a, a punch time card and then it would come into the office and they would load that data into the computer, and then we would analyze it and uh, keep track of the the number of hours we worked on each job, yeah. that sort of thing. So yeah, these right. are all Fortran programs that we had in the um, um, in the in the uh, GE timeshare and I I'd have to go back and look but I don't know if we ever loaded we were able to load these tapes into the HP through the teletype it's quite possible that, that we could have loaded the tapes into there as well but we might have just transferred those paper tapes to a to magnetic tape mm. and HP probably helped us out with that because yeah. obviously they're trying to sell computers back yeah then. sure yeah yeah customer service was a was a a, a proper 
terminology for the people that actually helped you. They had right. the, they had the technology and the education and the expertise in order to mm -hmm. do that. Not today. So, right. could you eyeball anything that's Wang actually a Wang loading I'm program? Not, see, I'm going to look at this one. Uh, uh, the second script. column always here. That's the, column this column is the readable script. one. The other ones. Yeah. yeah, you were trying to go over to. Oh, we got you on the other screen now. Oh, okay. Okay. There we are. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to see what some of these are. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Now it's a little okay. Yeah, that was a. You could you can as soon as you click on it, you can tell if it's Fortran yeah. or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you get down. Some of these. Let me look at this link too, because that could be a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, these are also all Fortran. All right, we can poke through them if we see something other. If we we we'll know that it looks, we know it it should look like a column of um, these, yeah, Wang commands. So, uh, we had some errors in there. So, um, um, Jeff has noted where some errors in some of the readability. Even if we went back and tried to reread the stuff, one, this is a know. pure binary file. So let me look at this. Mm, might not. It. Might not the problem is it won't show. display. It won't downloaded. Display. Yeah. You'd have downloaded. To, yeah. You'd have to go look at it in the download directory. Okay. Like if we were in Unix, you'd download it and use OD on it. Mm, mm, gotcha. Same thing here. Okay. I don't think the browser has a um, an octal view. That would have been nice. Gee, they're not supporting us. Vintage guys. Yeah, all this darn HTML gets in the way. <laughs> yeah, see, these could have been all pre-printed. Well, like a lot of pre-printed forms. Hell, that yeah. happens to be one of them right there. So, yeah, because if you see, of the header, mm -hmm. you took the header, a heat exchanger specification mm -hmm. sheet. Yeah. Yep. So we'd, we'd have pre-printed forms made up, and then all the, uh, the computer had to do was print out the uh, the data in, right. in, in yeah. the right spots. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we put the customer in and some of that, but. Uh... All right. Well, I think um, we're, we need a break. Okay. Time to eat. And uh, we'll, we'll look over what, what else we might want to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. We may or may not be done. We'll okay. See after we eat. Mm -hmm. Well, we can hook this up after lunch. And, okay. And yeah. Let's That'd see be cool. it's wacky type okay. of stuff that it does. Yeah, see. It Watch your back there that you don't stab yourself in the like rack ears. Yeah, yeah. Rack rails. Yeah, so this, you can see when it's on, but there's a uh, one, a decimal point only. When you go to enter a number like one, mm -hmm. one comes up, but when you do two, it, it looks like it's going over the two and then also putting it in the wrong mm -hmm. two. Right, like I said, it's doing goofy now, now stuff. Now three is okay. Then four, it comes up with five. Five, yep. Uh, see, when I hit five the first time, it missed that digit. Those seem to be okay. Let me see if there's a change signs not working. Hmm. hmm. Turn a little bit towards you, and we'll okay. have a little clearer display. Yeah, it's, it, this is, is that repeatable? Does that do the same thing from the start, or is it, it seems is to it be random? Random, okay. All right. Let me, let me just do all ones. The second tube, it's but when you press it, it's going to the third tube. It's not like it's that it's not registering the second one; it's going to the third. And then the, the right. third one, it just it got brighter in the. Right, yeah, yeah. And four is okay. Yeah. Five's not working, then it goes to six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so we got some, we got some latching issues or something right. like that. And it's it, it's not the switch because obviously it, it goes in other places. So yeah. like I said, yeah. the switches are easily repairable from the standpoint again because it, it's a separate mechanism underneath that much I got by turning it. I've had, I've been mm -hmm. in the inside of that. 
and it's a mm -hmm. separate micro switch assembly that's underneath the actual button operator. Okay. So that's the click you hear. Yes. It, but it's doing the same thing every time. Yeah. yeah. So if I hit clear all, and then all the, you can see clear all the zeros aren't coming up in the second, in the uh, fifth positions. Yep. Right. Yep. So this was the only one where everything got taken totally out um, of, of the chassis, which is mm -hmm. underneath, and everything got taken out of this to basically do yep. a minor cleaning, but not a major cleaning. And um, we checked the power supply. I knew the power supplies were going to stay up without going over. The one thing I, that, that hasn't been decided yet is in the chassis itself, is there, are there cards, some of those cards, regulator cards, or is this thing running totally unregulated? Because the actual power supply themselves are just a, a, a bridge rectifier and a couple of caps, and that's it. And one small cap, but, but it's not needed, like for 35 microfarad for 200 volts. So the open circuit voltage coming out that's lighting up the, the Nixies is about 200 volts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our engineers are saying, that's a little high for yeah. Nixies. You, know, mm -hmm. you only need about 135 volts to, to fire it off, but that's, that's the open circuit voltage. What I haven't measured is, I don't know whether I did or I didn't, uh, measured it once I got and said, all right, I'm gonna flip the switch and we'll get first smoke off of this, as we say. And since nothing smoked or anything like that, I got into the chassis and actually tried measuring the bus once once all the Nixies were lit. And um, it was still sitting around 200 and change volts since firing that off, so. Okay. So we're in a better position than I thought we would be in with this, with getting this machine straightened out, starting with what you've done here. Um, because uh, we have developed, I've developed a relationship with the uh, old computers that net. Um, with Rick. Yeah, Rick. Okay. You know him too, I'm sure. Um, but we've been uh, corresponding, and um, since this uses the 320 calculator chassis, he has those. He knows it's basically a documented part of the computer this computer mm -hmm. hardware wise we don't have right. any other for the rest of the computer at this point but right. for because this is the 320 calculator he knows all about the 320 he's got spare boards he's got working ones that we can easily compare and contrast and figure out what this is not doing right and uh, so this won't be too hard for us to um, oh. to get get this level working can you go back to the keyboard view? Yep, There's sure one can. thing I was curious about. Yep. Um, I can't see the keyboard Oop. on the screen, though. Uh, yeah, we'll come over a little bit. There. there go. So I see here on the keyboard, there's a plus here and a plus there. Because right. I said that there are two. There's, uh, yeah, there's a, a right adder and a left adder. Okay. Huh. Okay, so uh, you, can, you can store... Um, so if you have a number like six, mm -hmm. and you want to store it in the left adder, mm -hmm. and then you want to do something with the right adder, and then add the contents later to the left adder, you can do that. So, so this will clear the adder. This will recall it. So if now if you're this is in the left adder, if you go to the put let's say twenty three in the right adder. Mm -hmm. Add it to the right adder. Now, oh, here's, there we go. And the 23 came up now when we added it. So, and then if we, and then we can say, uh, recall adder, we can, we can recall this one. That should give the six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And say plus. Mm -hmm. Should have been And now if you recall. So if we say, recall adder that's what's in there this one still has six mm -hmm. this one should have so let's see let's recall this one and add it to this one see now we're somewhere in the 30s but that did just not working because mm -hmm. it, it was mm -hmm. it was 23 plus six should have been 29 now this should be 35. Mm -hmm. so if we do it again that should hit, go to 4 41. okay nope. just not displaying right mm -hmm. not the yeah 
You guys take a guess. This is problem in. Now the, we're up to fifty-three. See? In the keyboard or in the calculator? Well, it's not in the keyboard. So, I'm, I'm I mean, not the, sure. key, the, the unit. The so unit. It is, it, is like it part of? Is it the problem? Is it misbehaving like here or is it misbehaving down that there? That we that we don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying so, to take an educated guess. Because it looks like <laughs> the display is going wonky because right. the, it got the number and it's giving the proper results. Right. So that's good news. Yeah. That's why, again, thank you for demonstrating. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Fortunately, now, it works we're about well the L enough to demonstrate that. So this is that. the L yeah. register here, then? No, this is, okay, all the operations that occur in the L register are the blue keys. Okay. So if, you, it. It, so okay. if we hit, uh, so let's say we want, let's try to keep it. Uh, let's, let's clear all here. I believe that register and everything. This will clear the display, and this will clear all. So if we wanted to keep it in the registers, we would, wouldn't hit clear all, we would just hit clear display. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say we just want to just say two, enter. So the enter will go into the L register. Hmm? L for left, right? Wow. Correct. Yeah, and it does, it does funky stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Now is the L register out to memory? On the on the rack? No, it shouldn't be. It should be all registered. It should be here. part of the arithmetic. Yeah. You now see, mm. I don't know, but the rack's not plugged in. So. Nope. Right, and you you know, and, and the bus line. Bus, you're not you're, bus you're line. not that chassis. So not let's up see. To the bus line. Let's so. see what um, you have the book. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look at the enter key because mm -hmm. I believe it's going to be a forty-one. Yep, see, you enter, mm -hmm. code is 41, 41 is coming up on here. Okay. Okay. Oh. Uh-huh, binary, or there. Mm -hmm. So, the, see, the binary oh, yeah. code comes up. Okay. I'm going to clear, because I don't know what it's doing. <clears throat> we'll try it again. We'll, we'll say three, enter. 41, still 41. Now let me try to do something. Let's say two divide. No, it's just it's just. Um, yeah, that would be the only um, understanding. Is is it trying to talk out via the bus line out to memory back there, which obviously is not the uh, which, which it can't do right now. But it doesn't understand that. No. I think it would, so, that would only happen if we were doing this something well, on maybe, here. Yeah, it seemed that would be my that would be my thinking. But yeah. it's, maybe this it is, is supposed using, to be just calculated. Maybe it is using it, the memory to perform a, a, some functions. But I could I couldn't see why because then the memory if it's being used for something else, right? You wouldn't want to overwrite mm -hmm. it. Right. Yes. Yeah. You wouldn't have any control over it. Whether what you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. before lunch was. Yeah, you have control of the registers actually putting memory in that. So, so let's yeah, so, yeah, it's a little funky let's stuff. Tr let's try if we take five and take the log of five. No, see, see, that's 42, which you see the log mm -hmm. is 42. Now, what's the um, the SIC here? What did, was those, because that's the so, first time that's gone on, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the, <clears throat> those are... Um, and I'm going to have to, those we use a lot <clears throat> when we're debugging. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, and, I, and I'm, I'd have to, I have to look those up again. But um, when you're stepping through a program, okay, we use this because it tells you what the code is as you're going through each memory address. The okay. memory address comes up on the, on here. As you're stepping through a program, it tells you what memory address yet is oh, in this case. I'm in the way of the, of the panel. Just doing it's okay. okay. Yeah. Close enough. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Here's the, pa uh, the panel he's talking of with the uh, indicators. The memory address here, address register. Uh, I've, I've got a, yeah, I'm not totally familiar with, uh, with, with all this means. I know if you're stepping through a program, and it's on, you put this on step here, mm. and then your instructions come up here. So this, mm -hmm. but I'm not, 
That's what I was hoping. Some of this would be working. I could yeah sort yeah. of do do it by the process of elimination. Yeah. But uh, next time, yeah, next time we can't wait. Yeah, that's it's a slow process that you don't want to blow anything up. That's right. the problem because now you're in museum functions yep. of documenting an artifact before you can actually step through. It's, it's a laborious process, unfortunately. So the arithmetic, you, the keyboard, page two here probably just has a short introduction. Um, see, it says here it's identical to the 320 electronic desk unit. Mm -hmm. um, Except it has a bus line. The bus, the bus, bus line, line talks to all the other so, modules. So they had to do yeah. something to the box to interface it to bus line, but other... But, they bet, well, made it, it I mean, because all these, all these have to go into memory. Yeah, but I mean, as far as the, that chassis there goes, that can't be exactly like a 320E because it's, it's just compatible with one because it's got the bus line on it, which is 320E you wouldn't have. So, But I'll buy that it's completely compatible. It should operate exactly like a 320E. Technically, when you turn it on and do nothing else, it should... Act just like a calculator. Yeah, it should. That should behave like a three hundred and twenty-eight. Yeah. But later on, they they talk about stepping through the programs. Uh, but I've got. To, I've got. I That's okay. Have to look into. We don't. We don't have detail. to go into that detail. Yeah, let's I let's I, revisit that when it's working, and we can. We okay. can do step stepping. We don't have to know it now. Very good. But as you're pressing these keys, the uh, the commands are coming up, which is good. I think the jump command yeah. would be uh, 137. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 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 That is so cool. So we have um, and the switches above the indicators that, that give you the functions are for. I think if you want to manually input a particular code, mm -hmm. okay, uh, you can you can put these on and say ent ent enter them somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know the if you know the uh, okay, binary you, you code could do for put the right the, uh, put the code there for C C S. If you put the same numeric code in here right. and somehow do the enter, it's the same as hitting this. That's right. Okay. I guess I'd have, to, I'd have to play with it a little bit. It's been a lot of years. So. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. See, um, oh, so uh, a little little back to uh, previous topic. Uh, you guys said, yeah, this is what you would have on a programmable calculator. You'd have your program statements are, are buttons on the calculator like this is. Right. I thought, I, you know, we experienced that again later on in the 80s when this machine put the basic functions on a key. You didn't have oh, to for, type for, in like go for, to, for G-O-T-O. Yeah. You just, you hit a button for go to. Right. And that's, <laughs> that's so there weren't two, yeah. This no, is, uh, so this is so the we gotta show it, yeah. This is a, the Timex Sinclair type of uh, computers had single button mm, programming keys also, uh, oddly enough. So that's yeah, what so it this, reminded me So this me is of. your um, <clears throat> not having been a programmer calculator guy. And the important thing is, let's say you're um, <clears throat> when you're programming you, and you have to input a number, like like you're storing a number in seventy eight. So you okay. would say store store seventy eight. You and you want then you want to get load a number into your register. You have to say load W next and then get control back to the register. Otherwise, it's going to con continue thinking that it's a higher storage number. So you always need to have some kind of a command uh, when you want to get back to the, the right. W register. Yeah. And again, that, you that's explained. Do something to reference it so that now the context is that right. register. Mm -hmm. You're getting control back to here. Yep. yep. All right. We'll log that away for hopefully when we're working with it. But the manual itself, um, again, yep. Sorry about that. All of those cards that you have. Yeah. If you go back into these, these they're all here in these examples. Okay. 
And years I'm glad ago, you mentioned it because I didn't correlate it. I, didn't, I thought it was unique programs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that uh, someone had carefully conjured <laughs> up. Uh, so, right. like this sequence: TTC CCS zero continue. Yep. Uh, is what you need to do to enter something into the computer. Mm -hmm. Enter a, a number into the register. Gotcha. And then that CTU makes the uh, computer continue. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so now I don't know if anybody ever spoke with, uh, I, I noticed some of the interviews, somebody said they spoke with Frank Frantanella. He was the guy at Wang. Oh, oh many there's years a ago. website. It might be, might be the old, old calculators. There's two writers on there. There's a the battle something gentleman who I've just started talking to. Um, battles, battle.net. Jim Battle? Is that his name? It might be his last name that runs that. Uh, right. Maybe that's yeah, why it's he called writes battle. that. And he, he documented one of them, either Rick Bensine or Jim Battle, documented the interview that he had with the engineer that worked at, that's at right. Wang. It, and, with Frank Trentinella. Yeah. Yeah. But I got him. Did you get to I, meet him? I met him when I was at, at Wang Labs. I never met ah. Dr. Wang, but I, I did meet him on one, gotcha. of, one of our visits up there. Mm. But I understand that uh, I think he might still be alive. He was, I think they said he was 95 or something. Or oh, 80, God bless 85. Him. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. But it sounded like somebody had interviewed him. Uh, and I'm just wondering I, none who of that our was. Guys did, yeah. but. If, if you read that on the web, it might yeah. be one of these two gentlemen. And they talk, well, they did talk. I mean, the website, whichever one it is, talks about yeah that direct testimony from him and stuff. He stuff that Frank gave to the website guy, okay. I think the battle guy, and so he has unique artifacts from Frank. Um, but a lot of the documentation, somebody had knocked on Frank's door and said, uh, "Do you have any documentation on this?" He says. We went out to people and nobody wanted it, so it all got pitched. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew, right? Who knew? You know. So, did you talk about anything you remember with Frank? Ta what's it? How do you pronounce it? Trantanella. Trantanella. Yeah. Uh, I don't really remember anything no. specific. I mean, I was. Uh, I just took did, a trip up with did my boys. around or something? Yeah. Or? Yeah. They took us through the, the the lab, and I think that's when. <clears throat> I think that's when we were upgrading. I don't know if it was from the 1K to 4K or. Okay, or, or, all right. But. Uh, Did he expound you know, on his um, bus, his uh, the bus I, architecture? Or, no, I, I don't all? remember yeah. much of that. It was probably, we did a lot of business up in Massachusetts at the time, you know, combustion engineering was oh, up there. Yep, yep, Stone and Webster was one of our yep, good customers yeah. out of Boston. So it, we probably took a, couple day trip and then stopped in there on the yeah, way sure. say hi yeah. 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 yeah so goodwill yeah. yeah so i yeah it wasn't I, it wasn't I, like you're in there for a technical seminar right. or something right? yeah gotcha that's interesting though that you met him i mean the, he's you know one of the number two guys i guess from well, that's when i saw that he had been interviewed i said well if he's still around maybe we can get some information from yeah. him but if yeah um right right but my guess is if he doesn't have any any hard uh, information, it's going to be hard. Yeah. yeah. But it would still be cool if nobody has interviewed him to get his, his recollection of his whole time. Oh, sure. This, yeah. this was an interesting thing. And he, from what I read on the website, that uh, it was an interesting time of him building this, designing this, Dr. Wang being... Not sure whether he wanted to go this yeah. way or this way. He had to be convinced to get involved in this project. Yeah, right. He was yeah. reluctant to do it. So there was it was quite a little uh, cross in the crossroads for mm -hmm. um, for Wang. And uh, well, you know, Wang eventually they 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 went into the uh, word processing mm. market. That's the direction they went in. And, yeah, Jeez. and mini computers, but both right. they got, had both of those running. But, yeah. but I think at one point they had more word processors. Than any other company in the world. Yeah, like uh, sold. Lanier was one of the competitors. Yeah, at the oh, time. yeah right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. Lanier, yeah. And uh, yeah, back then the machines were not general purpose. Um, uh, what was it the work page writer? There's an IBM product as well. IBM had several attempts at yeah. uh, these. Um, um, yep. Yeah. 
uh, what's that called? Uh, Connor, we need you. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So, you know, and then I think when IBM came out with their PC, it sort of blew everybody out of the water. But we also yes. had a, a Freedom Flexerator. Yes. Which was a form of a word Flexor processor. Writer. Burroughs had one too. I yeah. was trying to think now of the Now the Flexerator was just essentially a, te a teletype. Uh, exactly. You know, so where you had standard letters or things, standard forms, and you would just... Uh, so the real issue is what was it attached to? The Flexor Writer itself was just a teleprinter. It wasn't attached to anything other than... That, I think he's talking about a later product that was more... Advanced, yeah. but or no, if you're no. preparing paper tapes, you just use the teletype in local mode and you just str you know, strike a key, punch mm -hmm. the tape, and it was. Uh, but the Flexor Writer itself, I think, had some uh, other functions that made it easier to use for, st for standard letters and things like that. Mm. Like you could position the printing on different parts of the page for you, could be, or maybe oh, you could stop I and, got it. And, and print things in, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, yep. Uh, form yeah. driver mode kind right. of right. It would stop, but and I maybe you could print, and then you could it would print some more. And then some capability stop. like oh, that too. A okay. Programmable. Wheel. I worked on a Flexo writer long it ago. Would, it was attached to an LGP twenty one. Um, the interesting thing is that it was a type, essentially an electronic typewriter. So you could probably set tabs on it. Yeah. With teletypes have no such concept. Right. So if you set tabs and margins, and yes, you're right. The tape had a stop code, mm -hmm. so you could have a tape going. You know, print a form, stop, type, and then when you press the start key up on the upper uh, mezzanine, it would continue the tape. Mm -hmm. And people who used to uh, go to uh, carnivals would know this <laughs> because there was this fake handwriting analysis. <laughs> it was a flexo writer with a tape hidden underneath the decorative <laughs> panel, and they'd press the start button, it would print something and stop on its own. And it was just, the tape would continue with the rest of the messages every time they press start. <laughs> so that's why knowing that Flexor Writer stopped was the, uh, yeah. <laughs> how this, uh, that thing worked. <laughs> All right, tell us about the other Wangs you know about. The other Wang 4000s that um, you've become aware of around the country? Well, we, you know, at the time we weren't aware of too many. But, you know, uh, you were all again, we, were a, we weren't a computer company, we were an engineering company yeah. and manufacturers. So, Using computers, yeah. Yeah, so we didn't really have that much knowledge of other people in the area that had them. Um, my only knowledge of recently is that uh, there, might be, there might be some museums like yours that are displaying some old wangs out on the west coast you've heard that you've heard of it uh, yeah because they got a butt right mm -hmm. well they wanted this machine oh that's we, right they wanted they, this yeah, they, machine. They, yeah they, they expressed interest and uh okay you were more local so we we felt that was a better fit less chance of damage and shipping we well yeah and yeah, uh yeah you know Can we're in new jersey you're in new jersey yeah. <laughs> helping helping out us east right. coasters yeah yep we're, but, we uh, appreciate that uh, We've, but the, it's always been a crown jewel of our our room, you know. It's, yeah. it's really special, and uh, there can't be guys. There can't be too many um, people that operated these still around, too, right? So your testimony here about using it is just pretty priceless, too. Yeah. So appreciate you coming down. Uh, and I can't. I can't imagine that say that. <laughs> I said I can't imagine there's too many people that kept them. Um, you know, we had a. Well, your point before is not too many were sold either. The, right, not too many were limited. sold. And then we had um, we had our facility in Clifton and we bought another facility in Passaic in, in the mid-70s, 76, 77 or so. Mm -hmm. And my boss didn't want to get rid of it. So that's why he said, let's box it up and put it in storage in that building. And it sat on the second floor of that building until we sold it the building in, in, in 2017 oh wow <laughs> so then we, wow. then we brought and then we sold the building brought it, what are we going to do with this so then we said well let's see if anybody's interested so oh. I can't imagine other people would have kept their machines no. or stored them so yeah that's the other reason why I say it's probably very rare well, to, to, well, to find yeah. one of and was it was it just his personal connection to it he didn't want to let go or did he think that he might actually need it to run something that no, just I ran think, right I, on I, it i something? think he was a sentimental type sentimental good for him <laughs> good for him 
He's got to come down to our museum. He'll get very soon. That was John. Is he gone? He passed away in 1979. Oh, not too long after you. Well, what year did you decommission this? I would say it's probably around 75 or so. Okay. 75, 76. Well, like I said, there's there's inspection stickers in some of those yeah. drawers that are 1979, 78. Okay, then I put it in. Oh, so a little it later. Yeah. 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 yeah, that it adds, I saw it said 76 in there. Yeah, yeah, but there's, there's okay. one, I think, one I'll think a little we'll bit later. We'll take that. pictures yeah. of them. and yeah. so Because we, we didn't get our, uh, our HP until 77, maybe 78. And that's when we really started transitioning everything over to our in-house computer. So I'm sure a lot of the, a lot of our drafting people, because our draftsmen used to used to run it, because uh, they used to do the calculations. Okay. That they put transcribe onto their right. Mm -hmm. So they would do it on this, plot on this computer. Wow. I mean, that's a far cry from having to sit there you with your slide rule and write your intermediate results. That's right. Yeah. That's Unless right. you had lots of slide rules. <laughs> I don't think we have that many slide rules. When we get this part working and we refurbish the other modules, first the power supplies, whatever we do to put it where we think it's ready to power up, we might get lucky. Might It might start working. I'm glad you told us that it's heat sensitive and it'll get flaky. So we will try to operate it cool so mm -hmm. we know that we're not running into that issue. Um, if we run into more problems thinking ahead, I'm thinking we might want to have a programmable microcontroller device to monitor the bus line and maybe become a device that we can inject the commands on the bus with. You okay. got any appreciation for that? Like, oh, that'll never work? Or uh, um, did they ever offer some kind of a debug? This was the debug, I guess. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can debug, you know, through this, uh, and this, ah, this will tell you how to debug your program. That's true. If this is working right, then we can be pretty sure we're pushing commands in, you know, across the bus reliably. We, we might not need to go that far, but. And we have great insight here Whoa. on the panel because of the, um, well, the displays. Yeah, 12, true. There are 12 bits here on the memory address and address register, 8 bits. Uh, here on the memory buffer, output, instruction buffer, and yeah. there's a state, uh, eight bits here of a state machine, uh, uh, state shown. So we probably can ascertain a lot from that. Right. And like I say, even just the fact that this lit up with the instruction is, is very helpful. pretty cool. Yeah. Now I think once we get the, this working, As soon as it goes to that one register. Now my guess is, and that's because, you know, it's, in order to, perf to perform the logri logarithmic function, it's got to go through the, the boards to. Yeah, a lot of it's exercise. Come up with the right? results, so. Yeah. So uh, other than sensitive to high heat, any other um, trouble spots, uh, funky things to, keep our eye out. No, or, no, none that I remember. Okay. All right. So you are still at Atlas, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What's your title there now? What do you do? Well, my title what is, do you do? is QA manager, but I'm, oh, a, really? I'm a part owner. Okay. Um, John DiLorenzo's son, Frank, is one of the owners, and, I, and I'm one of the owners. So. Originally, Atlas okay. was, was three owners. Mm -hmm. um, John DiLorenzo, his brother Frank DiLorenzo, and a third partner, John Beekle. John wanted to, he was in strictly as a, as a uh, investor. Okay. He wanted to get out in the late 80s, so I, I bought his share in, mm -hmm. at, in 89. Mm. And then when uh, John passed away, his son Frank took over his shares. And then when his uncle, then his uncle wanted to get out of the business, he sold those shares back to the business in uh, about 2010. Okay. So it's just the two of us basically running the business. Okay, neat. But I'm, I'm, right now I'm doing. I'm in charge of engineering and quality assurance. Okay. He handles mostly purchasing and sales, things like that. Gotcha. You get involved in any of the Sounds regulatory like really ISO stuff? 
we do some of the ISO stuff, um, you know, not not too much. We, we were doing a lot of work for Europe, which was ISO. A lot of our calibration is ISO related. Okay. Um, our welding procedures are synonymous with AS uh, with ISO. Right. Okay. Um, so you're using European standard, not necessarily American type stuff. Well, we use it, the American it, on our code committees. We try to align it so that we right. can, you know, yeah. you comply with one, you comply with both. Both of them. Yeah. That's typically how they're 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 closely written that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My my end of, of my work was also involved in the. 9000 series in the uh, 17025, which is a t oh, testing and competence right. standard. 17025 we we'll use all the time because right. it's for, okay. for calibration and testing. Uh, right. So you are you accredited? We use we we use we're ASME accredited. Okay. But but we use ISO 17025 accredited laboratories right. for our calibration. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's typically you know what my right. end of the business does because mm -hmm. to actually get in the accreditation and get accredited it is a royal pain in the butt. oh i know you yeah. basically get you know reamed a new you know yeah. new rear end on a lot of well that. it's the same thing you know we we have our nuclear qualification so yep. asme comes in every three years yep. and they go through the whole, our whole quality program and you know right. all the, mm -hmm. the training and non-conformities and you know yep. so it's uh yeah in fact we go through again next year so mm -hmm. <laughs> I had an affiliate where I was writing, writing their uncertainty budgets, which okay. I didn't find too too difficult. Everybody was like, "Oh my gosh," you know. <laughs> but sometimes you have to teach the auditor your business in order to audit correctly. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Been there, done that. I, uh, you know. I, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. They. Um, you know, and every business does things a certain way. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the only. You know. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the auditors come in, they're used to certain things and they expect yep. to see it done a certain way. way. And we don't need to do it that way in that right. type of precision because yeah. our customers don't require it. Right. So why do we have to go in that type of precision, you know, or that type of stringent, you know, and you have to basically teach them the facts of life. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's a, like that one, one quarter of the, uh, of the, um, of the tolerance, you know, like if we're allowed oh, to four to one pressure four to one tolerance, to, you know, yeah. <laughs> test to uncertainty, test to tolerance ratio, yeah. And you start going, okay, now we we have our own test gauges, right? Okay. Yep. That we calibrate to a master gauge, which has yep. to be calibrated to four to one. Yep. So we send that master gauge out to a lab to be calibrated, and they've got to calibrate it to four to one. Oh, <laughs> so how far do you go? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where the yep. uncertainty is all coming down, down into it. Atomic yep. particle. Well, it doesn't get to be that bad, but it's just, yeah. you know, what do your customers require? You know, we had a similar situation to try to teach the auditor. Uh, he, he was saying, we, you have to get your uncertainties down on your ensemble of a height gauge, a surface plate, mm -hmm. and a dial indicator. Yeah. And we're sitting down at, with, a, with an ensemble of about a um, TUR of a thousandth of an inch. Mm -hmm. He says, we got to bring that down lower. <laughs> Why? Because we're using that, we're using right. a small comparative plate. I'll be quick, uh, and bringing it out in the field. So right, running it into a truck and stuff, and we've calculated the expansion coefficients and all that stuff for the for steel height gauge. Mm -hmm. And we walk on into the customer. We're only measuring to maybe fifty thousandths. So you got a fifty to one test uncertainty ratio. How far down do you want to bring it? It ain't going to make any difference in what the customer's measuring when you had to explain it to them and just say, why do I have to go down any further? Yeah. And he well, had to think a minute and he went, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he has his tail between his legs because yeah. now you've shown him up. You know, and, yeah, and it's just, you know. And, and, when we're big, these big weldments, we're dealing with tolerances of plus or minus a quarter, plus or minus yeah, an eighth. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned a, a ways back, I think I caught, you still run HP computers, uh, minis, or what do you well, run now in engineering? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an HP, it's, it's, I guess you would, I don't think you'd call it a mini, but it's an HP 9000, 9000 Unix operating system, with a Unix That's operating right. system. We, well, you were in Unix way back. I yeah, mean, we had the HP 3000. Right? The HP 3000 was one of the first mainframes that Hewlett Packard made in the 70s. Okay. And then they, you know, they went to, eventually got to the 9,000. So yeah, we went from a- 1,000 here. Okay. So we went from a room that housed the 
good size mainframe, you yep. know, to <laughs> this, you know, the 9000 is just a... Okay. Is that still current? Or is that um, kind of legacy at this point, the 9000? I, I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, it's, I mean, it's probably legacy. I don't think okay. they've, I don't think they upgraded anymore. Yeah. But we have a service contract on it. They'll no service kidding. It. Yeah. Really? And, um, you know, we do a tape backup, you know, just a cassette tape backup yeah, yeah. every night. QIC tapes. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. So the the PC didn't make inroads. Well, no, we or, we, or, still, we still use we we still use PCs throughout, but our Fortran programs they still the Fortran programs, they, they still yeah. run off of that. Uh, gotcha. So they so they they yeah. log in through Reflection. Are you familiar with Reflection? I'm no, not. That product. No. No. Yeah. So they get onto so Reflection allows our PCs to talk to the Unix to mm. the HP Unix. Right. Okay. okay. It's a special yeah. terminal and, emulator kind yeah, of. Yeah. Then thing. we can get into then we get into the Unix and we can do all of our yeah. uh, programming and editing and. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Very true. Yeah. Boy, I think that comes pretty full circle. Um, yeah, I got nothing left. Any questions for us that's relevant to this? I mean. We can tell you all kinds of things about the museum and things, but that not on camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, at this point, I'm just yeah. interested in seeing how the progress you make, and if you yeah. just keep us yeah. abreast. That'd be great. It's just, you know? you know, it's very, very slow that process because it, yeah. of the documentation. Right. So, yeah. You are gratified that we're really digging oh, yeah. on this. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I'm yeah, glad. I think. Uh, I'm glad. It's, it's it's good to see, and I and yeah. I hope we can get this operating. It would have been nice if this was operating because it would tell us a lot. To, it's right? close though. It's yeah. close. If once it, once this is working, you know everything else is easy. I know. think so. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, so um, you so you're saying the memory everything was pretty reliable through all the time you used it. Pretty much, yeah. We we never had too many too much trouble with it that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So that. Hopefully that Except core high temperature. Is, is stable. You know, it hasn't had any broken wires in that core. Yeah. That's the only yeah. thing I'm, I'm horrified at. Yeah, that, well, yeah, mm -hmm. our concern is that, as you said, it was stored un, uh, un, uh, for so many years. Yeah. Uh, foam and things turned to dust. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. probably because of the temperature conditions, but I know yeah. that, that it was boxed pretty well. Mm -hmm. I remember. So, it, I mean, it was protected from the outside elements, mm -hmm. but it wasn't in a, in a, in a temperature-controlled atmosphere. So. Yeah. Well, that's better than most of the things I've handled. Yes. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, we thank you so much for connecting yes, with us, you. for yes. convert all, all the emails that we tossed back and forth. Um, you've given generously of your time. Yeah, we appreciate that down. very much, yeah. and we look forward to hopefully um, getting this working and working, having you come back and experience it. And we'll do a next next deep dive because uh, ultimately we want to demonstrate this machine and we, so we'll be crafting something that makes it do something here yeah i don't think there's any there be, maybe there's something well this is something for us to think about over time is there anything that was in the area or the way you used it should we demo those kinds of things would that be meaningful or show well or or should we sidestep that and just make something? I don't. Know. That's the thing. Kind of things we'll be thinking. Well, about. I think I think for the most part, you you know, most people know math. Um, yeah. So you probably want to do some some kind of mathematical um, solution that people would understand. I, okay. I, like I don't know when probably you so. when yeah. you show people the the products. I mean, how much time do you spend on one particular product and and. Uh, it, it's not ours, so you want to it, get something. You well, know, it depends on right. the person. Depends on the yeah. person. Depends oh, really? on what they're okay. interested in. Yeah. It's so, so we tailor we tailor our presentation to what they want to know, and if okay. they so good. Yeah. So if someone's um, said this is the only Wang we've seen on the East Coast. Tell me everything about it. Uh, kind of like the wise son, you shall tell them down to the wire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tell them down to yeah. the wire. I love it. Yeah. Well, we can, I mean, you might want to show them how, uh, you know, you put in a program segment and it operates and then you put another segment on top of it and it finishes the, oh, know, yeah. that, that sort so of So that sounds yes. like what we really want is kind of a smorgasbord yeah. of um, pre-programmed 
segments. Yeah. So yeah. you could sit and then we'd have a little table just like your boss had, a little handwritten table saying entry point 100 Pythagorean theorem, entry point 155 does something else. And we could just have them here sitting in the core yes. and just call them up. Probably mm -hmm. so. And that sounds like the way it was used originally. Is that right. correct? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And like I say, you can this way you can show how the, the, the segmenting works and then, you know, obviously the mm -hmm. printing you want to go print something and, and uh, load it from tape so yeah we can examine memory we can show them okay here's this is the set of instructions now i'm going to jump to that and do it you know right. and yeah good stuff it's not a too unlike a trainer is it really yeah. <laughs> like one of our microprocessor trainers yeah. it's really on that level because it's very visible that's why i was yeah. so surprised when you told me that the display was always active yeah yeah that's a shocker because yeah. that's very interactive even when uh, running a program which is normally just a worse world world of lights and when we get to debugging that will really bring this like yeah. to light yeah. that's right yeah and uh, it, it, in the section in here in debugging i mean it's it's short but it's pretty well explanatory at the end mm -hmm. Okay, because we had some lights coming up that were not normally used. So you see, it was the debugging of the lights here. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. It'll tell you actually if we want to look at that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I had this on, on my computer and I was searching because <laughs> it's because yeah. it was a the searchable text search PDF. Was, yeah, I gave, gave you a searchable, I, and, and I could find I, it pretty quickly. Um, I was glad my software supported that. <laughs> I can't uh, stand on such PDFs. I mean, you used this before post-its were invented. I don't know how you can yeah. survive. <laughs> I, I hear you. Before what was invented? Post-its. Post post oh, post-its, post yes. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, most of us are accustomed to putting little tabs on the pages, so yep. you know, yes, like bookmarks. That's right. Yes, right. But before posters were invented, it was destructive. You bend yep. the pages or yep, use labels. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, corner of the pages. There's yeah. a whole section here where it starts on program. Let me look at the beginning. Maybe it'll tell me the page. You're right. It's harder to grip <laughs> when on all the page. else fails. Looking for the contents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Debugging operation seven, page sixty. Sweet. Near the end. You would think it'd be at the, at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wait for you to make all the mistakes. Okay, yeah, now, let's, now we'll tell you how you can go about So it says it. the step mode is useful. So the, the step mode is. Um, is. It was a toggle switch, right? There's a step here. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, okay. Um, and it says. Okay, it's possible to walk through the program seeing the results at each step on the keyboard display. Each addition, in, in addition to the W register display, the operator can see the code of the instruction just completed. This code appears on the keyboard as well as in the output buffer on the memory control chassis. The memory address mm -hmm. display will show the address of the next instruction and the memory buffer will display, display will show what the next instruction is. So it shows the address and then the actual instruction. So like I say, if you go through that section. It cool. Yeah. That's the, that's the essence. You gotta be able to see what's there, see it execute, see what the results are, and go back and fix it. Yeah. So well. by watching the memory buffer, we can see that we're reading memory right. and what's read from it rather. And I think Matches mm -hmm. what we put in. Right. Mm -hmm. Make sure all the bits stuck. And it's. And yeah. I guess the one is for the. I don't know. That's the storage. The the, the storage uh, address or the. I don't know what the memory address and the address register is, but I've, I've got a. I don't know if one is. Where you're storing variables and one is where your program. Address is. It could be. Yeah. We'll find out. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Okay. I know I'm, I'm kind of fried. I don't think I can go <laughs> anymore. We got so much information. Um, so we're going to be signing off this recording. If you're watching it, uh, this was recorded in Wall Township at our Vintage Computer Federation Museum. 
at InfoAge. Come out to see our museum. Come out, come out to see, uh, see InfoAge. Uh, InfoAge.org and VCFed.org. Put a date and time web. stamp of what day, in case. Because, ah, yeah, right. Okay, date, date, time stamp. And uh, so stay tuned for another uh, interview like this in the future. We hope to make many more.